thing. Grant, Lord Jesus, that my healing. name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. You showed favor to your land, O Lord. You restored the fortunes of Jacob. You set aside all your wrath and turned away from your fierce anger. Let us confess our sins to the Lord, trusting in him for forgiveness. Heavenly Father, though you have called us to be holy, we fail you time and time again. We stumble in the face of temptation and sin against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. Restore us, O God, for the sake of your Son. He endured temptation and won the victory. He suffered and died in our place and earned salvation for us. Pour out your unfailing love upon us and grant us your peace. Amen.
Show us your unfailing love, O Lord, and grant us your salvation. Surely his salvation is near those who fear him, that his glory may dwell in our land. Almighty God, in his mercy, has given his son to die for you, and for his sake forgives you all your sins. As a called and ordained servant of the word, I therefore forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. You may be seated. The Old Testament reading for today is from Deuteronomy chapter 26. When you have entered the land the Lord your God is giving you as an inheritance, and have taken possession of it and settled in it, take some of the first fruits of all your produce from the soil of the land the Lord your God is giving you, and put them in a basket. Then go to the place the Lord your God will choose as a dwelling for his name, And say to the priest in office at that time, I declare today to the Lord your God that I have come to the land the Lord swore to our forefathers to give us. The priest shall take the basket from your hands and set it down in front of the altar of the Lord your God. Then you shall declare before the Lord your God, my father was a wandering Aramean and he went down into Egypt with a few people and lived there and became a great nation, powerful and numerous. But the Egyptians mistreated us and made us suffer, putting us to hard labor. Then we cried out to the Lord, the God of our fathers, and the Lord heard our voice and saw our misery, toil, and oppression. So the Lord brought us out of Egypt with a mighty hand and an outstretched arm, with great terror and with miraculous signs and wonders. He brought us to this place and gave us this land a land flowing with milk and honey. And now I bring the first fruits of the soil that you, O Lord, have given me. Place the basket before the Lord your God and bow down before him. And you and the Levites and the aliens among you shall rejoice in all the good things the Lord your God has given to you and your household. This is the word of our Lord. The epistle reading is from Romans chapter 10. (coughs) The word is near you. It is in your mouth and in your heart. That is the word of faith we are proclaiming. That if you confess with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For it is with your heart that you believe and are justified. And it is with your mouth that you confess and are saved. As the scripture says, Anyone who trusts in him will never be put to shame. For there is no difference between Jew and Gentile. The same Lord is Lord of all and richly blesses all who call on him. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. This is the word of our Lord. And then the Holy Gospel for today, Luke chapter 4, the account of Jesus' temptations in the wilderness. Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, returned from the Jordan and was led by the Spirit into the desert, where for 40 days he was tempted by the devil. He ate nothing during those days, and at the end of them he was hungry. The devil said to him, if you are, in the, if you are the Son of God, tell this stone to become bread. Jesus answered, It is written, man does not live on bread alone. The devil led him up to a high place, and showed him in an instant all the kingdoms of the world. And he said to him, I will give you all their authority and splendor, for it has been given to me, and I can give it to anyone I want to. So if you worship me, it will all be yours. Jesus answered, The devil led him to Jerusalem and had him stand on the highest point of the temple. If you are the son of God, he said, throw yourself down from here. For it is written, he will command his angels concerning you to guard you carefully. They will lift you up in their hands so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. Jesus answered. It says, do not put the Lord your God to the test. When the devil had finished all this tempting, he left him 
until an opportune time. This is the gospel of our Lord. And now, would you please stand as we say together the Nicene Creed. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of his Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten, not made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made, who for us men and for our salvation came down from heaven and was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary and was made man, and was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried, and the third day he rose again according to the scriptures and ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of the Father, and he will come again with glory to judge both the living and the dead, whose kingdom will have no end. And I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son together is worshiped and glorified, who spoke by the prophets. And I believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. I acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins, and I look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. And you may be seated for the next hymn. Dear brothers and sisters in Christ, today's sermon is going to be a little different than normal. We're going to walk through the gospel reading that we had verse by verse and just break it down. This is a text this Sunday of the church year we have every year. It's in multiple gospel accounts. It's a text that you know well. So we're going to take a deeper look at it today. So go ahead and open your bulletins back up to the gospel reading um, from Luke chapter 4. And so to put that first back into its context, the text of Luke chapter 4 is immediately following Jesus' baptism. At least chronologically it is. There is a genealogy section that Luke gives us in between the baptism and the temptation account. But it is immediately afterwards. Christ has just been baptized in the Jordan River by John the Baptist. The Spirit has descended on him in the form of a dove, and the Father has proclaimed, You are my beloved Son. With you I am well pleased. So we have verse 1. Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, left the Jordan and was led by the Spirit into the wilderness. 
This is something that we've talked about before, that Christ came, Jesus came to be Israel reduced to one. That is, he came to fulfill everything that God commanded of us as his people, to live as God's people should live, and then ultimately to restore and to reclaim God's people to himself. This is Christ's mission. This is what Matthew means when he's talking about the accounts of the baptism and the temptations and says it was done to fulfill all righteousness. Jesus is doing this on our behalf. He's enduring all of these things for us. Verse two, where for 40 days he was tempted by the devil, he ate nothing during those days, and at the end of them, he was hungry. The Jordan River, led by the Spirit, wandering in a wilderness, 40 days, tempted by the devil. Is this starting to sound at all like the people of Israel? The people who only had to cross the Jordan River in order to enter into the land that God had promised to give them, a people that had been led by God for 40 years as a pillar of cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night a people who ended up lost wandering in the wilderness for those 40 years because of their disobedience, their disobeying God's commands, a people who bought into the devil's temptations that they could not trust in God to take care of them. And we have Jesus eating nothing at all for 40 days. So of course he was hungry when it was all over. He was fasting. Fasting is without a doubt, a huge topic among Christians as we start the season of Lent. If we want to get technical about it, Jesus fasted in the original sense of the word. He gave up food for a period of time. Today, the word fasting can be applied to basically giving up anything you want to give up, um, and it's usually done within a religious, within a church context. For example, Catholic churches, as most of you well know, give up meat during the season of Lent, which is why you have all those fish fry Fridays. It's why if you drive by a Culver's, they'll have a fish of the day posted on their sign right underneath their ice cream of the day, which might be a temptation to some of you. But that's what they give up. If we look outside of Christianity at the idea of fasting, the Muslim uh, community fasts during a, a special season of theirs that they call Ramadan but their fast looks different. Fasting during Ramadan for them is a matter of not eating or drinking anything at all while the sun is up. So you wake early in the morning, you have a large family meal, then you go off about your day, and when you come home at the end of the day and the sun sets, you have another large family meal together. The Christian church, whether it's in America or other nations, is divided on this issue of fasting. So where do we stand? Do we fast? Should we fast? Martin Luther wrote about it in his section on the Lord's Supper in our small catechism, saying, fasting and bodily preparation are certainly fine outward training, but a person who has faith in these words, given for you, shed for you, for the forgiveness of sin, is really worthy and well prepared. He was also known by people in his lifetime for fasting to the extent that his body looked frail and weak. If you want to fast during the season of Lent, by all means, go for it. There's not a command for it or against it. The purpose of fasting, though, is for you to focus on your relationship with God. Perhaps you might give up something like Facebook or TV for the season of Lent so that you have more time to spend with God on a daily basis. Or maybe you want to give up sweets or desserts so that every time you see one for the next 40 days, you pause and you reflect and you pray, and that's this way to strengthen your relationship with God. For this reason, you can't fast from coffee if you don't drink coffee. That doesn't work. Nor can you fast from a certain pet sin of yours that you seem to always love to do because you shouldn't be doing it anyway. Fasting is a sacrifice meant to strengthen our relationship with the Lord. And so then in the text, we're going to see three temptations of Jesus during his time of fasting. It certainly sounds like Satan was tempting him throughout the 40 days, but these are the three that the scripture writers bothered to record for us. 
So we have verse three, the devil says to him, if you are the son of God, tell this stone to become bread. What's the temptation? Is he the son of God? Of course he is. Can he tell the stone to become a loaf of bread? Sure he could. So what's the temptation? What's actually the issue with this? And it lies in the fast. That by eating bread during his fast, he would be breaking his fast. He would be disconnecting himself with this Israel reduced to one that he had come to do. He would be severing that connection. He has to see it from start to finish. He has to take our place. Verse four, Jesus answers, it is written, man shall not live on bread alone. Now we could read that on its simplest level. We could think, well, you know, of course, we want some meat, we want some cheese in our our diet, some, you know, sugary goodness as well from time to time. Maybe, Maybe a fresh salad. That's not what Jesus is talking about, and we know that. He's talking about faith. He's talking about trust, about where our life really comes from, that true life is found not in food, but in the body and blood of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, the blood that has set you free from the guilt and the punishment of your sins, the blood that washes you clean and makes you pure so that you can stand in the presence of a holy God. The very same blood that gives you a relationship with him, that you would be loved, that you could receive his gifts that he has for you through word and through sacrament. In verse five, the devil led him up to a high place and showed him in an instant all the kingdoms of the world. It's interesting to stop at this point and and think about what power Satan actually has. For him to be able to take Christ up to a high place, and in an instant, show him every kingdom of the earth. Devil's powers are real. They're limited, but they're real. Maybe they're on display here during the 40 days. Maybe they're not. The temptation, though, for us in this section, for us to ask is, who's the king of the world? Who actually owns all of this? So to think about that for a second, when God created, it was all his. And he willingly and he gladly entrusted it to his children, to Adam and Eve, as a father would entrust to his children. That's what he did. And then, as we know, Adam and Eve betrayed him. We have betrayed him. We've handed the garden to Satan. This is the fight. This is what Christ's ministry is about. Who has the power? Who has the keys? Whose world is it? Christ has come to reclaim it for God. In verses six and seven, and he said to him, I will give you all their authority and splendor. It has been given to me and I can give it to anyone I want to. If you worship me, it will all be yours. So yes, we could certainly make the argument that they're not actually his to give anyway, but let's play the what if game for just a second. What would have happened had Jesus agreed Had he decided to do this Satan's way, definitely easier than his father's way of going to the cross and dying in our place, what would have been lost? Like the Israelites, he would have failed and made himself an image, an idol to worship instead, and who knows, maybe the universe would have imploded upon it happening. We'd certainly be doomed, which is why we rejoice in verse 8, Jesus answered as written, worship the Lord your God and serve him only. Thankfully, we don't have to wonder. There isn't a what if game. We don't have to guess because Christ refused. He stood up to the temptation and he stated what Israel should have when the devil tempted them, that Yahweh alone is our God. And in this sense, worshiping and serving the Lord are actually the same thing. Live your life trusting in the Lord, believing in him and in his promises for you that he will deliver you. And that's precisely what Jesus is doing as he refuses the temptations of Satan. Verse nine, the devil led him to Jerusalem and had him stand on the highest point of the temple. If you are the son of God, throw yourself down from here. Again, maybe we have another showing of Satan's power to be able to lift Christ onto the top of the temple. It's estimated by researchers, we're talking about 100 feet off the ground. 
maybe. But either way, Satan is setting the stage for what comes next. We again can think of it as, could Jesus do this? Sure. But here we go. Verse 10 and 11. For it is written, he will command his angels concerning you to guard you carefully. They will lift you up in their hands so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. Satan quotes Psalm 91 to Jesus. Here he throws the word of God right back at Jesus. You want to quote scripture to me? I can play that game with you. In fact, Satan loves playing that game with all of us. He loves taking the word of God and distorting it, contorting it, twisting it away from what it actually means and into something else. He did it with Eve in the garden. He's been doing it with us ever since. Jesus responds though, verse 12, Jesus answered, it is said, do not put the Lord your God to the test. Again, Christ denies the temptation. We are not to put God to the test. It was actually a rare gift, indeed, the ability to put God to the test. He once gave Ahab that opportunity. Ahab was one of the many kings of the nation of Israel, and Ahab refused. Thomas had the opportunity. If you remember after the resurrection of Christ, saying he wanted to put his his fingers in the nail holes. He wanted to be able to see and touch the risen Lord. Thomas got that opportunity. Many people today want this same chance. They want to they say, if, if God will just give me a sign, I'll believe. That's not faith. That's not trust. Verse 13, when the devil had finished all of this tempting, he left him until an opportune time. It's not really that Satan had given up. We know better than that. He still hasn't given up. But rather, what we see here is simply him conceding that he had lost this particular battle and that he's going to try again later. And while he certainly works against Jesus throughout the next three years of Christ's earthly ministry, the opportune time that Luke is talking about, we would most readily connect with Maundy Thursday to the night when Jesus is betrayed by one of his own, when he's arrested and tortured. To each of these temptations that Jesus faced in these 40 days, he responded the same way. He trusts in the Lord. He remains faithful to what the Father wants him to do, and he uses Scripture. He uses God's Word as his weapon to fight against the temptations. Martin Luther once wrote in his house postal sermons, the experience of Christ after his baptism shall teach us how every Christian after he is baptized is enrolled into the fighting army against the crafty devil who makes frequent attacks and stirs up persecutions all the days of our life. As followers of Christ, as children of the Lord, Satan indeed attacks us every day. It's so easy to forget it, to get caught up in the wilderness that is life and not even realize that there is a war being waged all around us and that we're in the midst of it. But that's just another form of attack that we're convinced that there's nothing around us. But the truth is, when you came to the font, when you were baptized, God looked down upon you and he called you his child. He said, you are mine. And in doing that, he rescued you from the clutches of the devil. He restores you to his side of this war. And the devil's temptations are now coming at you in your life full force as he tries to steal you back, as he tries to win you over to his side again into the fires of hell. So the way that Christ responded to the devil's craftiness is a lesson for us. It is the same way that we should respond. We know that the gifts of God are the very things that sustain our life. From his death on the cross to his resurrection, those gifts that give us freedom from our sin, from death and from the devil, and the gift of his word that he enables us to grow in our relationship with him each and every day. And then we also know that we are to serve Yahweh alone, that there are no other gods but him. And so we gather together here as his community in this place that he has blessed us with, that he has given to us. And we receive his gifts through his word and through his sacraments. We pray, praise, and give thanks for all that he has done for us. And then we go out 
and we live the lives that he has given to us and we serve him. We love our neighbors as he loves them. And lastly, we do not put the Lord to the test. We know better than to toy with fire. We know better than to wonder how close to sinning can I really get before I get burned. That's, how, that's not how you fight a war. We put our trust in the Lord. We put our hope in the body and blood of Jesus Christ. We put our hope in the sure and certain power of the resurrection from the grave. Amen. This time I invite our children to come forward for the children's message. Good morning. morning. There's a few more kids out there that chose not to come up this morning. How are you guys today? So we talked about Jesus being tempted in our scripture readings today. What's it mean to be tempted? You want to do something. Okay, you want to do something. Okay, you want to do something that you shouldn't do. Okay. Sometimes we use it just for what you said first, something you want to do. You might be tempted to go home and eat chocolate. Is that a bad thing? No, as long as you don't, you know, eat the whole bag. But that could be a temptation of something you shouldn't do. Yeah, temptations... Another word for it is test. It's something, it's a, it's something that we go through, something we're, we're tried by. You know, we, you're right, we want to do something. And, and in our context, when we talk about Jesus being tempted, it is something we shouldn't do. So Satan is, is trying to get Jesus to do things that Jesus knows he shouldn't do. And Satan does that to you guys too, but we'll talk about that in a little bit. Do you remember what Jesus' three temptations were? What did Satan tempt him to do? Right, there's our first one. All right, Jesus, you haven't eaten anything in 40 days. How long does it take you guys to get hungry? 10 minutes? minutes? (laughs) I would agree with that answer. It's not long. I mean, once you've finished eating one meal, it's like, all right, when's the next meal? An hour for you? Okay. You're a little stronger than Haley and I am, so it's good. So, you know, Jesus has gone not 10 minutes. He hasn't gone an hour. He's gone 40 straight days without eating anything. Do you think he'd be hungry? What do you think? Would you be hungry? Yeah. In fact, I'm not sure any of us would survive that long without eating food. I'm not sure any human being has done it, but Jesus, being both God and man, um, could last a little longer than we could. Anyway, he was hungry. Luke even says that. He says, at the end of the 40 days, he was hungry. We get it. So Satan tempts him and says, all right, just turn that stone into bread and eat it. That'll solve your problem. You won't be hungry anymore. That was one of the temptations Satan gave Jesus. What was the second temptation he gave him? Okay, that was the third one, but we can talk about it. So Satan takes Jesus up on the top of the temple. So the temple was like their church in Jerusalem, the the main place where everybody went and gathered to worship the Lord. It was a little taller than St. John's. You know, this is, that's pretty tall, right? But it was a lot taller than this. And so he takes Jesus up to the highest place on the temple and says, go ahead and just jump. God promised, you know, he said it in the Psalms. He said, you know, he won't let you hit the ground. The angels will catch you. That was the third temptation. What was the second one? Which one are we missing? The 
Satan showed Jesus all the kingdoms of the earth. He showed Jesus everything in the world, and he said, if you just bow down right now, bow down and worship me, I'll give you all this stuff. It'll all be yours. The whole world will be yours. All the power, all the wealth, all the glory, it'll all be for you. It's a temptation because Jesus isn't supposed to worship Satan, right? We're not supposed to worship Satan, are we? Yeah. So these are the things that Satan does. How did Jesus respond? He responded the same way to all three of them. Do you remember? Well, that was how he responded to the third one. Yeah, he, he said, you shall not put the Lord your God to the test. Well, in all three of these, he quotes scripture. He responds to Satan with the word of God. He says, yeah, you shouldn't put the Lord your God to the test. Man shall not live by bread alone. You shall worship the Lord and serve him only. Those are the, the three things, and you can find those all in the Old Testament. Jesus is quoting all those things. All right, so that's how Jesus responded to temptation. Are we tempted? Every one of you has siblings. It's an easy example. Are you ever tempted to be mean to your brother or sister? We'll even take the word tempt out of that. Do you ever want to be mean to your brother or sister? Do you ever want to hit them or get back at them when they did something to you? Yeah, that's temptation. You're being tempted to do something you know you shouldn't do. How do we respond? How should we respond when Satan tempts us? We should respond the same way Jesus did. Put our trust in the Lord, that he loves us, that he has won, he has victory over Satan, and so do we, because we believe in Jesus. And then to respond with the word. And I told our confirmation class this week that you can't respond to Satan's temptations with the word if you don't actually spend time reading God's word. It's a gift that he's given to you. So during Lent, um, we have some devotions for you um, that you can go through. Let me grab those for each of you right now. These are kind of neat because they're 3D. And so there's a pair of 3D glasses in there for you. But some just, just some scripture for you to go through here during Lent. So there's a copy for each of you. And so you can see they're, they're nice and colorful. And that middle page, you'll see the 3D glasses are right there for you. And if you put those on while you're going through it, some of the stuff on the page will pop out at you. So go ahead and do that during the season of Lent. And, and read your Bibles. Talk about God with your parents and, and, and get to grow in your faith. Let's talk. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you. Thank you for sending Jesus to be our Savior, that he died on the cross to take away our sins, that he was able to resist the temptations of Satan because he, he lived a perfect life for us. We are so thankful, so thankful. And we pray that, Lord, you would help us to help us to to respond the same way Jesus did, that we would trust in you, that we would have faith in you, and that we would be able to, to say no to temptation um, with, the, with the power of the word, with your word, the Bible. Um, and we also pray that when we fail, when we do sin, when we fall and fail at temptations, um, we're, we're thankful. We're thankful for the gift of forgiveness that Jesus died on the cross to take away our sin. Um, we, we pray your blessings upon us and our families this day. Amen. All right, thanks for coming up. In our prayers today, we will... Certainly pray for the family and friends of Sylvia Schroeder upon her passing. Uh, we want to pray a prayer of thanksgiving for a couple of people that have had success in surgeries. Um, Joel Stitch, we prayed for on Wednesday evening, is the brother-in-law of Lisa Moham of our congregation. He had back surgery performed to remove a tumor. Uh, the surgery went very well, and he's actually already home and recovering, so we're thankful for that. We're also thankful for Darlene Wilson's surgery that she had on 
Thursday afternoon, and she too has already been able to return to her home and is on the, the, the road to recovery. So that's very good news. Um, hers was pain in her, her left arm, and it was an issue with the nerves in her back. Um, they were able to correct that. So she told me Friday that she is pain-free in the arm, which she hasn't been in, in a long time. So she is rejoicing. We also want to continue to pray for Arnie Smith as he returns home from Arizona, from his, his time in the South, um, but also as he, he follows up with his recovery from pneumonia and some of the other pains that he has been having. And we add to our prayer list today um, Frank, Bl- Frank Blondin, who is brother-in-law to April and Dwayne Schumann. Um, Frank suffered from an aneurysm um, in his kidneys and is in critical condition in Coon Rapids at this time. He required 25 units of blood, and April and Dwayne are are very thankful for the miracle that God worked in saving his life. Um, And lastly, we add this morning to our prayer list um, the Loris family, as Jenny's grandfather, Walter Bannett, is hospitalized right now following a mini stroke on Friday evening. So we pray for Walter and his, his family at this time. Please rise as we join together in prayer. Heavenly Father, we, we admit as we confessed at the beginning of the service that we, we do not always stand up in the face of temptation. That like so many who have gone before us, like all who have gone before us, um, we, we struggle and we fall. And we are rejoicing today at the, the promise and the sure hope and the power of the resurrection of Jesus Christ that he has defeated death, sin, and the grave, and that he has defeated Satan as he hung upon the cross, and that by rising on Sunday, on Easter morning, he has given that gift of life to each and every one of us. We pray, Lord, that now in that that forgiveness, we might live, uh, we might have that gift of new life, and we pray that you would strengthen us, uh, bless us, that we might be able to stand up to temptations when they come, and continue to comfort us in your, your reassurance and in your forgiveness um, on those times when we fall short. We lift up to you today a prayer of thanksgiving. Uh, we pray for Joel Stitch and for Darlene Wilson after their successful surgeries and that they are both home and doing well. We pray for our We Care staff. Uh, we want to thank you for Barb and Connie as they help to run our preschool, providing so many children in our community the chance to hear the good news about your son, our Savior. And we want to pray um, your presence at this time, your comfort, your hope to, to the family and friends of Sylvia Schroeder. We pray for her, her daughter, Latana, and for the rest of the family that you would bless them with peace through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. We also pray today for all who are sick, for all who are hurting. We lift up to Walter Bannett, Arnie Smith, Cindy Sin, Frank Blondin, Luann Gotch, Lyndon Luke, Nancy Hinky, Ed Drenth, and Wayne Breezy. And we pray, Lord, that you would be with all who, who continue to struggle with mental and emotional distress at this time. And we also pray that you would comfort and bless those who reside um, either in care centers or who are homebound in our community and around the world. We lift up all these to you and to our precious Savior, Jesus Christ, and we entrust them to your care. We pray all these things in Christ's name. Amen. This time you may be seated for the collection of the offering. Please do fill out the friendship register. And we want to welcome our guests, our visitors who are here with us today. Uh, We wish you God's blessings in in the midst of, of your week.
At this time, we want to invite forward all of our seventh grade families as they went through a milestone together a couple of weeks ago called a teenage home where sex isn't a dirty word. So please do uh, come forward at this time. We did have a couple other families who were able to be at the blessing of uh, the milestone itself but couldn't make it this morning. Um, so we'll be thinking about them as well as we go through this. Um, but these families gathered together to look at the idea of purity and what that looks like in today's, today's culture um, as they, these youth pursue, pursue that in their lives. Parents um, in the, the milestone were able to tie a piece of white yarn around the finger of their, their teenager as a symbol of God's desire for them to be pure and to honor God with their bodies as their bodies are, are, have been won by God, have been purchased at a price. Um, so the, the, the string was a symbol of a commitment that these youth would be making, um, that the gift of sex would be used in the way God had intended it within the context of marriage. Um, So moms and dads did this with their teen um, as a sign that moms and dads would be working together with them as well to pursue purity together. Um, So we we encourage parents now uh, to replace the the yarn, if it hasn't already disintegrated or whatever else, um, with a a real ring, a ring that will remind you, youth, of God's desire um, for your best, that you would save the gift of sex as it was designed to be used. Um, and that you would remember that you have indeed been bought at a price. You are not your own, um, but you are a child of God. So moms and dads, it is time for the blessing. So go ahead and take your son or daughter by the hand. Look them in the eye, you know, good communication skills. Say their name. And then repeat after me these words from the heart of God. You are not your own. You were bought at a price. Therefore, honor God with your body. Now, as you go ahead and replace the yarn on your son or daughter's finger with the ring, say whatever words you'd like to say as a blessing over them. Um, Begin by saying, you know, may God bless you. And as the parents are doing this, congregation, we welcome you to to bow your heads in prayer and a, a, a sign of mutual support for these families. And just as the final note, the other gift that we as a congregation are giving to these families is a a book. It's entitled Your Marriage by God's Design. It was written by another LCMS pastor and his wife. um, And it was a a good read just about what marriage actually is um, and what it should look like in the midst of a culture where it's hard to see that these days. So we we encourage these families to look to to the wonderful examples of of healthy and strong marriages all around you. Um, And we pray God's blessings upon you. Um, Thank you for coming up. You can return to your, your seats. And the service continues with the preface to Holy Communion. Please stand. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. In the wilderness, Jesus did battle with Satan and defeated him with the word of God. And the night he was betrayed, Jesus went to war against Satan once again. He sacrificed his body and shed his blood to free us from Satan's power. By his resurrection, there is victory. 
Now Jesus invites us to his table to be reassured of his forgiving heart toward us. It is here that he offers us refuge, safety, and rest. It is here that he strengthens us to live boldly for him. Our Lord Jesus Christ, the night when he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat. This is my body, which is given for you. This do in remembrance of me. In the same way, also he took the cup after supper. And when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you. This cup is the New Testament in my blood, which is shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. As often as we eat this bread and drink this cup, we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. O oh Lord Jesus Christ, only Son of the Father, in giving us your body and blood to eat and to drink, you lead us to remember and confess your holy cross and passion, your blessed death, your rest in the tomb, your resurrection from the dead, your ascension into heaven, and your coming for the final judgment. So remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you always. And you may be seated for the response. And please stand for the dismissal. Now may this body which was given for you, this blood which was shed for you, strengthen and preserve you steadfast in the true faith unto life everlasting. Depart in peace. Amen. And let us pray. I thank you, my heavenly Father, through Jesus Christ, your dear Son, that you have kept me this night from all harm and danger. And I pray that you would keep me this day also from sin and every evil that all my doings and life may please you. For into your hands I commend myself, my body and soul and all things. Let your holy angel be with me, that the evil foe may have no power over me. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon your favor and give you peace. Amen. We will sing just one verse of the closing hymn so that we can move on. Hymn 287, just one verse. Bar. 